I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled Dreamport, the U.S. Cybercom Mission Accelerator. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. First, all phones have been muted, except for the presenters. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Today's briefing slides will be posted on our website within a few days. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. My pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Dr. Gail Pomper. She has over 25 years of experience designing and installing computer networks. Gail is currently serving as a program director for Dreamport, which is the U.S. Cyber Command's Innovation Center and Mission Accelerator. In 2007, Dr. Pomper took a position with the DOD as a Global Exploitation and Vulnerability Analyst. Gail worked for 15 years as an independent consultant, providing network design services, customized training, and SharePoint implementation services. Dr. Pomper also holds numerous certifications. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Pomper. Good afternoon, Gail. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Steve. So welcome, everyone, uh, to our webinar this afternoon, where we're going to be talking about um, one construct of the United States Cyber Command, uh, which is a facility that we call Dreamport. Uh, it's our innovation center uh, and mission accelerator. Um, and before I um, start to talk specifically about Dreamport, I'd like to talk in general uh, about uh, U.S. Cyber Command um, and the mission of U.S. Cyber Command and then how Dreamport fits uh, inside that mission and how we're actually driving uh, forward uh, the, the mission uh, for our cyber warriors. So the first thing that we'll talk about is the fact that U.S. Cybercom is the newest uh, unified command. And the idea is that we are unifying uh, the direction of cyberspace. So there are many, many uh, cyber warriors um, in our organization today, um, something more than 6,000 um, at this moment, uh, at last count. Um, and those cyber warriors are distributed throughout various different uh, service units and so forth. Um, and they're also embedded in uh, our National Guard and our reserves. Um, and in addition to that, of course, um, you know, we supplement many of our cyber services uh, with our partner uh, services as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the corporate partnerships um, again, uh, in the context of Greenport. Um, but the idea here with our corporate partnerships is that at U.S. Cyber Command, we don't want to recreate um, existing capabilities and technologies. We want to be able to um, put to good advantage existing technology um, and then only de uh, develop uh, the kinds of things uh, which are unique. Uh, so what we're looking for in corporate uh, partnerships is uh, sharing with them uh, what our current needs are um, and the ways that we can actually uh, bring that technology uh, into U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, our customers, of course, uh, again, uh, are all across uh, U.S. Cyber Command uh, and various different uh, cyber elements. Uh, and they might be folks who are in some service-oriented uh, organization like R-Cyber or AppCyber, uh, Marforce Cyber, uh, Fleet Cyber, 
um, or again uh, in units that might be associated with the states and national guards and reserves and that sort of thing. So a little bit about what's been happening at U.S. Cybercom. So U.S. Cybercom is now a year old. Um, so it's been over a year since they were elevated to a unified combatant command. And again, the idea that we want to uh, pull together all of those uh, cyber activities that allow us to defend um, and also um, initiate operations in cyberspace. Uh, as part of that, uh, we've also been given uh, acquisition authority. So we actually have a command acquisition executive who is responsible um, for that acquisition program. And that simply means that we have the ability to be able to uh, create our own contracts and so forth um, and decide uh, how we're going to be acquiring uh, some of these capabilities. Uh, we also have something called the Unified Platform. So the Unified Platform is a program where we have created an infrastructure where we can literally pull in various different capabilities uh, that are already available. And of course, if you go out to the services uh, who are doing you know, the train, man, and equip mission, they have many capabilities themselves and what we'd like to do is be able to share those. So the Unified Platform gives us that springboard where we can pull in capabilities and um, make things available across different services and across different cyber units based upon need. Another thing which is new is this facility called Dreamport. So Dreamport is located in Columbia, Maryland. It's at 7000 Columbia Gateway Drive. And it is both a facility and a program. So Dreamport, the facility, is a place where people can go and actually interact with our various different cyber elements. At any given point in time, uh, there are always going to be you know, at least 20 or more uh, folks from U.S. Cyber Command who are actually um, doing uh, work at Dreamport, uh, things which they can do um, in an unclassified facility that they can then bring back to a classified facility and add it um, as a capability to a larger tool set. And we actually invite the public to come in uh, to interact with us at Dreamport, get to know people, understand the mission firsthand by providing a, um, an event on the second and fourth Monday of each month. Um, and you can come on over between 8 and 10 um, on the second and fourth Monday, and there are going to be uh, folks from industry, folks from academia, and of course folks from U.S. Cybercom uh, that you'll be able to have direct conversations with, talk about capabilities that you might have, ideas that you think will help us drive our mission forward, and so on. Um, and this last item here is just to remind folks that, again, many of the capabilities that we have um, throughout the DOD um, altogether um, uh, come from reserves and National Guard partnerships. So we have reserve and National Guard units um, all over uh, the country. Um, and of course in our uh, territories and so forth, where um, we call on these individuals um, to actually serve uh, our needs um, in various different places where we are executing cyber mission. And we rely uh, very heavily um, on these individuals um, who are continually um, you know, honing their skills and so forth and so on very often these individuals um, may have full-time positions in companies where they're executing cyber, uh, the cyber mission uh, each day um, from a, an in industry perspective, and they then bring uh, that knowledge with them when they come uh, for their uh, military duty. So here's just a, a short um, list. Uh, kind of broad groups of needs that U.S. Cybercom um, would have. 
Uh, we'll start right here with the first bullet we talk about in the Nuver tool set or exploit. We know that whenever uh, we go into uh, an environment where there's been some kind of a, uh, a cyber event, maybe some malicious actor has been detected, or there's some kind of anomalous behavior, our cyber warriors are going to go in there and they are going to defend against that. Um, and uh, in order to do that, they need to have um, the requisite tools and capabilities uh, to operate in that environment. Generally, these are going to be tools that they can set up very, very quickly, um, get a good view of that overall uh, network and that environment uh, in order to be able to understand um, the cyber activity that's occurred there. And in addition, um, you know, there might be some response uh, that we uh, might want to execute um, against an adversary. And in order to do that, um, we might need some kind of an exploit. Uh, or we are seeking to understand uh, exploits as they're developed. Uh, signature diversity uh, is something we're very interested in. Um, the technology behind how all of this um, malicious uh, code is created. We know that our adversaries um, are very technologically astute and uh, they have ways um, that they can write code, uh, which can be very difficult to trace. Um, and when we are trying to defend uh, against some kind of malicious actor, one of the things that we've done in the past is relied on signatures. So clearly when you're operating in a scenario where uh, adversaries are using polymorphic code, where that code is changing very, very rapidly, uh, we need to have some kind of a defense against that. So this is an example uh, where we see that there is a very strong need. Penetration testing. Penetration testing is uh, where we're sending our cyber warriors in in order to determine what the status of the defense is for a particular network area. Um, this is going to be necessary to, um, to be performing sort of on an ongoing basis, right? We always want to ensure uh, that we have good defenses. Um, and so there are lots of different tools um, that you can use in order to perform that testing. Some of them might require you to be uh, in a physical location. Some of them might be tools that you're able to execute remotely. So um, big need there. Um, and then the last one, uh, we talk about cyber autonomy. Um, so adversaries create and tear down uh, virtual networks with seeming impunity, right? We're always hearing about uh, how you know, somebody's gone in, uh, they've set up some IP space, they've used that as a mechanism to launch some kind of attack, uh, and then they're gone. So our cyber warriors also need to be able to operate with that same kind of execution speed. Uh, we want to be able to meet that adversary uh, head on, um, tracking them down, and, uh, and then also predicting where they might be going next. So, um, Tools that give us uh, that kind of autonomy, that ability to be able to um, establish an ephemeral network and, and take it down very quickly. We also talk about deployable toolkits. When we are asking our cyber warriors to go to different parts of the world um, in order to meet those adversaries head on, they often need to carry their toolkits with them. So we need smart toolkits. Uh, that allow us to get set up very, very quickly and again be able to look across that environment and identify uh, where there might be areas of weakness and so forth. Also talk about um, the ability uh, to execute command and control, right? Uh, that command and control often does need to happen remotely. So again, this is a continual area uh, of research. Um, trying to hone those tools and make them better and better. And there may also be some times when we want to execute uh, without being detected, right? We might want to, um, you know, do something that's a little bit stealthy. So having those kinds of tool sets that enable all of these capabilities, these are the kinds of things that 
um, that we're looking to acquire um, within U.S. CyberCom. Uh, talk about analytic tools. Um, so behavioral kinds of things, we're trying to determine who these adversaries are. Uh, machine learning to allow us to harness the power of automation. Um, and then, you know, smartly getting after um, the entire, you know, realm of cyberspace uh, using artificial intelligence, intelligence, uh, cognitive intuition. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, identify when we have patterns and so forth, and when those patterns are sort of moving uh, across networks through different geographical regions and whatever. That ability to detect that very, very quickly, um, you know, at, at the speed, um, you know, of the network. Uh, this is something uh, which we're really uh, working very hard on. Um, one of the organizations that we have uh, working um, at Dreamport currently um, is the Joint um, Artificial Intelligence Center, um, and they are um, in the process of developing uh, sets of tools to help us in that area. The organization where Dreamport um, executes from, um, responsible for the management and oversight, uh, is the uh, technology outreach organization within the J9 in U.S. Cybercom. So the J9 is responsible for technical outreach across um, a variety of elements. Um, we reach out to uniform services, of course, uh, in order to, to share tools and technology and capabilities. Uh, we reach out to industry to understand what they have available right now today in hand uh, and to um, provide information about the things that we think we'll need going forward in the future. We look to academia because academia are typically doing some of that hard work um, of researching, you know, what are the next things that we're going to be, uh, to be looking for um, there are uh, many, many, you know, doctoral students, master's students, and so forth who are engaged in basic research uh, at universities, uh, and we're always interested in hearing uh, what kinds of new cyber uh, research um, is happening out there to see what we're going to be able to acquire uh, and put to use quickly. Um, obviously, the research community, there are many um, labs which are focused on cyber issues, um, which who are also doing development and building tools um, for um, capabilities that we've identified and we have a need for. And then, of course, we want to collaborate with the rest of government. Um, and generally, that's going to be sharing uh, things that we've learned from these other communities and making sure um, you know, that everybody is operating um, at the same level of information. These are just some of the organizations with, um, with whom we've established partnerships. And you'll notice that um, there are a number of different cyber centers that we're coordinating with, um, many, many um, labs and research organizations. Uh, the Sorry. Um, Many um, organizations uh, such as CISA, um, uh, the Cyber National Mission Force. Um, this is not meant to be um, a total list of organizations. These are just some of our close partners uh, that we work with uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and certainly, um, these, there will be representatives from these organizations who uh, come to Dreamport um, and engage in some of the activities that we have there. So at U.S. Cybercom, um, you know, we have a number of different pillars uh, of, um, of capability, right? A um, number of different missions uh, that we are responsible for, um, defending the nation against strategic cyber attacks, um, operating uh, in and defending uh, DoD information networks, uh, supporting combatant commands, um, and we have sort of uh, divided up our uh, organizations, our cyber organizations, 
you know, sort of in those same pillars uh, to get after those uh, specific uh, kinds of missions. Um, so we have the defensive side of things, you know, where we're making sure that our adversaries are not getting the better hand. We have the offensive side who uh, may be going and executing operations um, against adversaries. And then we have ongoing operations. Um, so we have uh, lots of different uh, organizations who are attending to these. We have Cyber National Mission Force. They're actually located um, directly at U.S. Cyber Command. Uh, and then we have DISA and the services um, who have our cyber protection uh, teams or cyber protection forces um, who will go out and respond and who also have specific areas of cyber interest in some cases. And then what we refer to are cyber combat mission forces. And so these are forces, um, you know, which are throughout government and industry who all are helping us um, in this arena. So now we come to Dreamport. Uh, and we say where innovation comes to life. So if you were to listen to uh, a speech given by General Nakasone these days, one of the things that he might talk about um, is something that we refer to sort of internally as the three Ps. Um, persistent engagement, persistent presence, and persistent innovation. Um, so persistent engagement is about continuous action to enable our partners um, to respond to all the various different um, cyber activities um, that come about. Um, persistent presence uh, is about us staying on top of the adversary's actions and understanding where they're going and what uh, their next steps might be, uh, areas where we uh, might see them um, you know, getting ready to engage in some way. And the last one is persistent innovation. This idea that it's very important to stay on the cutting edge of technology. Our adversaries are certainly doing that. And we need to be able to match them uh, in that. Dreamport allows us to get after innovation. And we're operating in an unclassified environment. And we are able to bring in industry, academia, um, subject matter experts, and to do things very, very quickly. So if there's a new effort that we want to take on, we can get after that work immediately, within a day or two, um, versus uh, in normal, um, within, within the government, we would have to follow you know, some very strict protocol, which would naturally add a lot of time uh, to that. So the idea of having this unclassified facility, and here's a picture of it, is that we can sort of bring people together physically. But behind Dreamport, there is also a program. Um, we are partnered with the Maryland Innovation and Security Institute. And this is a nonprofit organization. Uh, it is composed of people who are deep experts in cybersecurity, folks who have been involved in this field for many, many years. Um, there are three directors, uh, Carl Gumtow, uh, Armando Say, and Tom Sadowski. And uh, these individuals uh, are responsible basically for running this facility on behalf of U.S. Cybercom and helping us to create the right kind of event and the right kind of response to the needs of our cyber warriors. So having the facility um, gives us a place where we can bring people together, but it does not limit us to this one location. U.S. Cybercom obviously operates across the world, and so we actually can execute um, programs, Dreamport programs, um, in many geographic locations as well. Um, this is a facility that is located at 7000 Columbia Gateway Drive, and again, uh, we invite you to come out and, and visit us here. We refer to this as being a state-of-the-art cyber prototyping and collaboration facility. The primary goals of Dreamport are to allow us to prototype new cyber capability and to do that through collaboration with as many partners who are willing to engage as possible. 
So we talk about um, our partnerships with industry. We've had many, many organizations who have come in, who have come in there and contributed their knowledge and capability um, to our various projects. It's managed by the Maryland Innovation Security Institute we talked about. So at any given point in time, um, you'll walk into this facility and you're going to be greeted by somebody from NISI um, and they're going to help you, you know, attend your event or show you um, to the area where you're going to be um, engaging in collaboration. These are three different areas that you're looking at. Um, the bottom one is my favorite. Uh, it is a picture of our what we call our maker space. And this is an evolving area. Any given day that you walk into that maker space, um, it may be built out in some very different way. Um, in fact, if you were to come today, you would find that that back wall that you currently see, which is white, is covered with programmable logic controllers. Uh, because recently we've been involved in a um, IT, uh, IoT, um, OT um, adventure. So we're interested in helping small manufacturers uh, measure um, and keep track of their cybersecurity posture. And these might be companies that are as small as one or two people. Um, and so this effort to uh, help uh, these small manufacturers evaluate their cybersecurity um, is something that uh, Armando describes as being uh, from the parking lot to the loading dock. So we're helping these organizations understand how all their various networks um, can be leveraged um, and might be leveraged by adversaries in order to get access to some intellectual capital uh, that these small manufacturers have. Uh, many of these small manufacturers are providing uh, capability for the Department of Defense, and we want to ensure uh, that their, um, their intellectual capital is not being stolen um, and that they are creating uh, tools and capabilities for the DOD uh, which are secure. So I invite you to come out and see that. It's, uh, it's very exciting. So what are the objectives of DreamPort? Uh, our objectives are to have a place where folks can come together and collaborate in a lot of different ways. So that might mean that we have some kind of a panel discussion um, about the state of um, you know, data devices, um, supervisory control and data acquisition. Um, it might be that we're having a discussion about reverse engineering. That's a recent uh, event that we had. Um, the reverse engineering uh, malware to understand how it operates. It might be uh, a collaboration to understand uh, a complete area of cybersecurity like zero trust. Um, these are all um, events and projects that we hosted at Dreamport that enabled our different cyber teams uh, to come together, share information, and to create prototypes. One of the other things we do is create challenge events. Uh, we refer to these challenge events as rapid prototyping events. Uh, and these are uh, events where we're reaching out to anyone in the public, academia, industry, uh, individuals, um, and we're showing them uh, what our United States Cyber Command challenge is, and we're asking you to help us solve that problem in an innovative way. We're also able to do rapid acquisition. Uh, when we host these challenge events, we are able to evaluate uh, capabilities. And if our cyber warriors decide that they uh, really like the way a particular capability works, we have an ability then, because it has been um, open um, competition, uh, to be able to uh, have a relationship with a particular organization that has that capability. So here's an example um, of the very first uh, rapid prototyping event. Uh, we called it the chameleon and the snake. This was a, uh, a rapid prototyping event 
where we had a number of, um, of participants. You can see some of them there. Uh, and we identified uh, some of our uh, winners. And essentially, what they were doing is um, coming up with ways of detecting uh, some kind of malicious code and then being able to modify it. There was a defensive uh, side and an offensive side. And of course, that makes sense because at the United States Cyber Command, we have both our offensive warriors and our defensive warriors. And we need to be able to generate capabilities uh, in both of those arenas. So in this case, our offensive winner was a company called Draper Labs. And we actually uh, were able to um, have a follow-on uh, contract with this organization who um, came up with a prototype um, that was very effective um, and was useful for one of our cyber teams. So this is um, an example. And um, just to let you know, if you go to the Dreamport website, which is dreamport.tech, we showed it earlier, uh, you can see uh, the results of these um, rapid prototyping events. So here's another example. We have something called the wolf uh, in sheep's clothing. This is another uh, rapid prototyping event that we had um, at Dreamport. Um, and again, this was a uh, another event. We have um, events around things like detecting, um, you know, who, um, what kind of devices we might have on a network. We have rapid prototyping events uh, to see whether we can detect um, all the various different um, types of uh, capabilities on a network which device is the mail server, which device is the DNS server. You know, are you able to go in with a tool and just very quickly create a map um, of everything that exists uh, on a network? Needle in the haystack. Again, another rapid prototyping event. I'm not going to talk about all of these individually. At the end, uh, I'm going to take you through um, RPE5. Um, which shows you very specifically how we actually operate these events. So what kind of successes have we had uh, for U.S. Cyber Command? Um, and what are the things that we're doing uh, which are different uh, than operating you know, inside of Cyber Command uh, proper? Um, well, so we are able to um, improve the time that it takes for us to um, award a contract uh, to or some kind of an agreement to work uh, with a specific partner, right? Um, we are doing full and open competition. And um, what we're trying to do um, is to rapidly identify new innovative capabilities but then also get those capabilities into the hands of cyber warriors in a time frame that makes sense. Obviously, if we're in a field where the landscape is changing so rapidly, we also have to be able to rapidly provide tooling to the folks who are working that mission. And if it takes you know, nine or 12 months to, uh, to actually go through that whole uh, pattern of, you know, advertising and, you know, evaluating, um, you know, evaluation and then award. Um, by the time we actually get that tool into the hand of a cyber warrior, that tool is not going to be as effective. So what we're trying to do here is where necessary, um, we are using this um, Greenport program to allow us to more quickly get capability in the hands of cyber warriors. So we say that the goal is to go from month to week in terms of identifying a need, finding organizations that are able to serve that need, and getting that need to our cyber workforce.
So again, um, we are doing this uh, through all of our various different partners. Um, and we are clearly going to be calling on the Reserves and National Guards uh, as partners. Um, we have uh, reservists and National Guardsmen who are, you know, uh, serving um, with U.S. Cybercom at all times. And we are looking to ensure that we are sharing all of these capabilities um, that we're able to develop at Dreamport um, with all of these uh, cyber partners as well. So we do some joint capabilities development, um, and of course we're sharing uh, technologies which are identified. Um, and in many cases, because our uh, National Guardsmen and our reservists are working across industry in many cases in cyber jobs themselves, um, we're able to really harness um, information uh, that about new capabilities that are being developed in that way as well. So this is just another key way that we're able to keep U.S. Cybercom uh, on the forefront of cyber knowledge. So again, what are the things that we need? We need defensive tools. We need offensive tools, we need the ability to create exploits, we need the ability to be able to harness automation. These are all U.S. Cybercom needs. And again, Dreamport is just one mechanism that we use um, for this. If you want to tell us about a capability that you have, we invite you to uh, send uh, a note uh, to our common email address, engage with Cybercom uh, at cybercom.mil. Um, you can also go to the Dreamport site, www.dreamport.tech, and you can leave uh, comments there. You can ask for uh, a meeting, um, schedule a meeting there. You can also come in and schedule a tour so that you can see the facility. Uh, and we'll take you around and introduce you to uh, our different cyber teams and let you see the, what, uh, the various different tools that they're working on and the challenges uh, that they're engaged in at that moment. Um, so uh, Carl Gumtow um, is the director of Dreamport. Um, and if you uh, actually come to the facility, he is likely to be the individual um, who is showing you around. Carl has been in the cybersecurity community for many years um, and has created um, a really uh, stellar um, institution uh, and facility uh, in Dreamport. Um, you start by coming into our kitchen where you can, uh, you know, everybody, all conversations, you know, start around the kitchen table, right? Um, so we have an area like that uh, and then sort of proceed through um, our various different collaboration areas and so forth. Uh, we are actually in the process of expanding uh, Dreamport. We have uh, another half of the building. Um, they just begun construction uh, on that. So if you come to the facility, uh, I'm sure Carl will want to talk to you about that as well. So um, just to talk a little bit more um, about some of the things that we're doing in U.S. Cybercom. Uh, I wanted to talk um, about a specific rapid prototyping event so that um, you would get a better flavor for, uh, for some of these events. So rapid prototyping events typically take place about once a month. Uh, something that we have to plan for. The rapid prototyping event is always focused on something that we refer to as a U.S. Cyber Command Challenge. And if you go to the Dreamport website, you'll see that we have a list of challenges, and there's also a link where you can actually contribute um, your own thoughts about these challenges and ways that we should get after them. In addition, if you go to the U.S. Cybercom public site at cybercom.mil, you'll see a larger list of the challenges. So at Dreamport, uh, we pull over um, uh, 
of some number of those challenges and work them directly at Greenport. And the other challenges um, are worked uh, in other mission sets within U.S. CyberCom. Uh, but you can get a complete list of all of those challenges. So here's, an, here's another picture um, of the facility. And we refer to an RTE event as being similar to kind of a hackathon. So they're not, um, they're not fully structured events in the sense that, you know, there isn't a script uh, that you're following. Uh, you're coming to the facility. You're, you're given kind of some general guidance. And then throughout this rapid prototyping event, we kind of um, throw you, you know, some challenges yourself to sort of to see how uh, the capability that you're showcasing, how it will hold up uh, under, uh, under fire, if you will. So here's some rules. Um, this, these rules, by the way, are specific for RPE5. It's not a competition. It's not a capture the flag. Um, so we're asking you, you know, we ask people, you know, please don't hack others. Um, so that's a little bit different uh, than, um, you know, a capture the flag kind of event. Um, we are expecting that very often competitors will bring in proprietary technology, and we're very careful to ensure that your proprietary technology stays proprietary. Um, we warn you about the fact that it's a live environment. In a live environment in cyber, you're likely to uh, encounter malicious content, and that's what's going to happen there. Um, you're going to be able to get access to the Internet. Again, um, your cyber actors are acting um, across the Internet in, in many cases. Uh, if you're using things like machine learning, uh, very likely, we're going to have folks who want to come and talk to you uh, in more detail about uh, your machine learning algorithms and so forth. So what is RPE5? You'll notice that the name of RPE5, the Chameleons and Snakes, is the same as it was for um, our very first RPE. So the idea um, with our very first RPE is that we were looking at Windows-based malware. And in RPE5, we expanded that aperture so that we're also looking at Unix and Android and other kinds of things, Linux, OS X, other kinds of executables. So what they're looking here for is um, automated signature diversity. Can you take some form of malware and manipulate it? Uh, in a way that it's no longer recognizable um, as the, um, the malware that we started from. And um, are you also, are, is it able to be detected still by your tool, right? They're doing this in a real world way. And uh, again, because this is both a defense and an offense uh, kind of competition, there are two different sets of results the defensive results for those products, and the offensive results for those products. And you can go right on the Dreamport website and get access to these slides. So what they did during that RPE is they randomly um, distributed malware. Uh, sometimes it was real malware. Sometimes it was something that we were pretending was malware. And the question is, was your tool able to detect the difference? And um, then we invited you to modify your tools to see whether or not you could, um, you know, can you modify them? Can you automate something? Um, can you do something to that sample so that it can evade detection? Um, and can you attribute them to known uh, malware families? So here's an example of what that might look like. So they've labeled uh, malware um, and they've labeled benign uh, executable. And then they just randomly go through and pull out some of these. So if you think about it, if I have a malware tool, that's really what we're asking to happen in the real world. 
we're asking you to look across network traffic as it's being generated in, in, in real world time and be able to identify, oh, that's an okay thing to let pass. And, oh, this is, this is something which is malware. We need, to, uh, we need to alert or we need to stop that or quarantine it or whatever. So this is to see you know, what happens um, in this environment which tends to use polymorphic code. So they're actually giving you some information, eight families of samples. Um, and they're um, also um, asking whether or not you can detect other kinds of malware. Um, then they're asking on the offensive side um, to uh, be able to see whether or not you might be able to alter this. And then would it still be detectable by the defensive side? So this particular RPE took place um, in May. Um, at Dreamport, and it was a multi-day event. Uh, so if you uh, and if you go online, you can, you've probably seen uh, some of the pictures of it. Um, they talk about um, the ability to use hackers and unpackers. Um, these were just some uh, some sort of rules for the offense as a de defense. Things you are expecting. So here were questions that we would have expected competitors to answer. Is the file benign or true malware? What family does it belong to? Is it from one of the eight identified families? Um, and is it similar to an offensive submission? And here are some of the performance criteria. You know, questions about whether or not the process you use is automated. This is important to US Cybercom because uh, automation is something that we're looking to use to really propel us forward, right? Um, hash value. Uh, does it generate a different hash value now? Does it support um, a different file type? Um, questions about whether or not it requires root privileges, right? So these are all. Um, Expected offensive output. Um, so Dreamport uh, basically, you know, mans um, these events. Um, the Dreamport stack there. So you have, you know, cyber warriors um, who work for Dreamport um, who are watching all of the competitors, um, kind of tracking their movements, um, and essentially throughout the event there are sort of points which are earned um, by each of those competitors. At the end of the, of the event, we kind of add up all those points, um, and that's how we determine um, whether or not uh, you know, someone's been successful. Uh, they also talk about the fact that um, generally they'll issue uh, I mean, alerts before something's coming, so you know to be on the lookout, so it's not it's not really, you know, a hundred percent random, right? Uh, you do get a little bit of warning, and I will just say that in general, the adversary does not give you a warning ahead of time. So, um, so we're actually kind of giving you a little bonus there. Here's an example um, of what that uh, alert might look like, and then these are just questions. Um, on the defensive side that you might want to ask. And then for offense, same kind of thing, same kind of guidance for offense, right? Um, they're giving you an example of um, a piece of, of uh, malware um, that has a, a hash in virus total and asking whether or not you could alter the signature. Again, this is um, a screenshot of that. And we're telling you, you know, how high does the bar have to be, right? On the defense side, again, just kind of walking through things that the defense should be doing. So I'm going to um, just end up here on this slide. 
Uh, again, uh, shout out to Maryland Innovation Security Institute, who are our partners at DreamCourt and make uh, this innovation and, uh, and mission accelerator um, organization available. Um, so folks are generally there from um, you know eight in the morning until six o'clock at night. Uh, Carl Gumtow um, is sort of the uh, operational director. Um, Jim Rylander um, is actually in charge of operations. He's often the person who's opening uh, things up first thing in the morning. Um, and one of the ways that we communicate with you uh, is um, via a sort of newsletter uh, that we put out either uh, zero or one time per week. Um, so that means that there could be some weeks there's no communication. Um, if you go to dreamport.tech, there's a link where you can click register. We're not going to overwhelm your inbox. Um, you get to decide uh, how much email you want. And this is going to tell you about the various different events we have um, coming up. Rapid prototyping events are not uh, the only way that you can interact um, with uh, Dreamport staff uh, and U.S. Cyber Command. Um, we've had numerous uh, technical panels there. Uh, we've had you know a couple of hundred people um, you know who are discussing you know relevant um, you know cybersecurity issues of the day. Um, we have also have um, you know, uh, analytic events uh, where people can you know sort of you know, test their analytic capability against others. Um, as well as the rapid prototyping events. And then sometimes we just have events where we're, you know, they're just collaborations, bringing people in uh, and giving them information. We had a recent small business event there um, where our command acquisition executive, um, Theresa Picar, um, basically introduced herself um, and you know, talked to the small business community uh, about what we're trying to do uh, at US Cybercom. So with that, uh, I am basically at the end of my presentation, and I would be happy to um, to take questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Okay, thank you, thank you, Gail. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty interesting what you've got going on down there. Um, so so I guess you know one of the questions that you know you've talked about the uh, the rapid prototyping events, the RPE. So uh, so you said you could go to the, you know, to the Dreamport uh, website to find out about them. Uh, do you get the word out uh, by other mechanisms? Like I was wondering about the um, uh, FedBizOps. Uh, um, is, is that, uh, you know, mechanism where you where you might advertise those events on on that uh, facility? Um, so in general. Um, we, we we always um, have them advertised uh, at the Dreamport event, but in addition, um, we have uh, other um, organizations uh, working with us to get out the word. Um, and the directors, uh, Armando Say and Carl Gumtow, um, are also you know always publishing these events. They are they make their way around to a lot of the different um, you know industry breakfasts. They have a lot of meetings with academia and so forth. And so we sort of get the word around that way as well. Um, but we're always looking for new ways to advertise. So you know, if somebody has a venue where we can you know, publish uh, information about the events, um, we are definitely interested in hearing about that. We also have a public affairs office. Uh, and our public affairs office also uh, helps us to advertise these events. OK. Uh, now, I, you know, you, you showed the picture, you had some pictures up there, you showed a picture of the lab. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how, how many uh, competitors can, can the uh, facility handle at one time? Is there, a, uh, is there a limit on the number of uh, companies or teams that, that can uh, come in at, at one time for one of the events? So um, I'm not going to say that there's a limit per se. However, when folks sign up for the different competitions, um, the MISI staff does go through um, the competitor um, submissions 
to make sure that um, that they're really going to be able to compete in that event. So uh, they're kind of evaluated to make sure they meet uh, the criteria that they would have to to be good competitors. So in that way, um, we tend to kind of narrow down the list of competitors. Um, but I will just say it does not have anything to do with size. We've had, you know, the largest of large companies there, and we've also had um, one-person companies uh, participate. So, um, in in and in addition, um, I think, um, you know, Carl and Armando are very much looking to ensure that we are bringing in, um, you know, folks. Um, who are, you know, we look to very much to be innovators, and often these are sort of smaller companies um, who are doing, you know, very, very risky, uh, you know, high-tech kinds of things. So there's always um, a good distribution uh, of the competitors. One of the other things that we will be doing in the future, a lot of our RPEs um, have been uh, something where you know people came to the facility, the Dreamport facility. So remember, Dreamport is a program, so we can also you know, harness other geographic locations. Um, and one of the things we're looking to do is to possibly add sort of a remote component to this. Um, and we have had some events uh, where there has been, um, you know, where there have been competitors who have been located remotely. So that's an area that we're looking to broaden. Um, I just want to uh, interject one thing, Steve. Um, so somebody sent me a note saying that um, folks were curious about how to interact uh, with the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, uh, which is doing some work there at Dreamport. Um, again, I would, uh, I'd like to just offer out to you um, you know, the ability to come to Dreamport um, on that second and fourth Monday for what we call our coffee and conversation. Um, so anytime between 8 and 10, sometimes we're there typically, you know, at 7 o'clock. Um, so, you know, you can come even a little bit earlier. Um, and there are going to be folks there. And if you want to talk to someone from the Jake, you know, we will certainly uh, make sure if there isn't somebody there, there, there typically is, but if there isn't, uh, we can go and talk to them and, and have somebody come on over uh, to share some of what they're doing. Um, I, I will just, I'm going to just say briefly, one of the things that they are doing there currently is they are evaluating capabilities that will be on the DISA approved product list. So this is a list where, um, you know, that DISA provides, where basically says these companies provide, you know, these basic capabilities. So that's one of the things that they're doing, um, you know, among others. Um, and that's, um, and, you know, I see somebody said, how do, how do I interact with the Jake? <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, I'm right there working next to them <laughs> um, all the time. So I'm not sure what the, um, what the person meant by you, um, but you know that's how any individual on the street would be able to uh, to come um, and talk to them. And in terms of U.S. Cyber Command, generally, um, U.S. Cyber Command um, interacts with all of the um, teams who are operating uh, at Dreamport. And they basically take the capabilities which are being identified and developed and bring them back inside uh, and apply them to mission there. So that's how that's how we would interact. Um, U.S. Cybercom would interact with any of the teams operating at Dreamport, uh, because our our whole goal um, is to uh, identify you know already existing capability or uh, work with companies to take a capability they have and sort of adjust it or modify it so that it better meets U.S. Cybercom need. Uh, and that's what we're doing on the Jake, with the Jake as well. Okay, uh, kind of following up on that, uh, your last point there, there was a, a question, uh, I think it had to do with, uh, you were earlier on you had mentioned uh, behavioral uh, analytics. And so the individual is curious if you were looking at COTS tools, custom, uh, or a combination of, of both of those. 
and um, you know if, if uh, you know if it had to do with custom or you know combination, uh, if you could provide you know maybe some more detailed examples of the you know on on the behavioral analytics area, what you might be looking for in the, in that area. So that I think is probably a question um, that you would want to put up on the Dreamport website. Um, just talking about capabilities in general, we are we we are looking to identify you know off the shelf you know already developed capability. And you know I, I'm just going to say we talk about commercial off the shelf, but there may be already developed capabilities which are not on the shelf as well, right? There there are definitely situations where uh, companies or individuals have or you know academic institutions have developed capability but haven't gotten it to market for whatever reason. It's hard to get a product to market. Um, and this is an opportunity for you to uh, maybe get that uh, product seen uh, by bringing it to Dreamport. And, uh, and I will just say that very often our cyber warriors do want you to make some adjustment to it. So we do hope that often you know, we can work with organizations and maybe adapt something so that it is more specific to the tasking we're going to be applying it to at U.S. Cyber Command. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I, early, earlier in your presentation, you had talked to where you had the uh, you know manufacturers uh, kind of bring in some of their IoT type of devices to help you know uh, evaluate their their equipment. Now um, you know as as you're doing that evaluation, are, by any chance are you also giving them some suggestions for how they can you know improve the security of those devices? So that <laughs> that's absolutely true. Um, so I will just say, whenever um, any organization comes to Dreamport and we're doing some kind of an evaluation, there's always feedback, um, which is delivered personally uh, by um, the the Missy folks um, who are who are conducting those evaluations. Uh, and again, you know, these are people who speak their language, right? Um, so these are you know long time uh, you know cybersecurity experts. Um, and you know we have a number of engineers and you know, computer scientists and so forth, so forth. So we have a you know we have um, you know behavioral scientists. We have all kinds of folks um, at VISI uh, to to get after these various different capabilities that we're working on. Um, and there's always feedback which is provided to the organization. There have actually been a few occasions where uh, a product was brought. Which had a vulnerability, <laughs> and and the Missy staff actually identified that for them. Um, so uh, <laughs> that uh, so those are the kinds of things that happen. We have um, we have a staff uh, that um, that tends to kind of morph over time. So uh, there's a regular Missy staff who are hired there, you know, sort of full time individuals. And we also um, have had the pleasure of hosting, um, you know, interns or high school interns, you know, interns from the service academies and so forth. So we get people in all the time, and they are also part of these evaluations. I mean, we put them to work, and you would be amazed um, how quickly young people can identify vulnerabilities. <laughs> they just think outside the box. <laughs> so they can uh, always come up uh, with ways. <laughs> Taking advantage uh, that, of something. Uh, that's that's great to hear. That's uh, that's uh, excellent that they're able to uh, participate and, uh, like I said, show their show you their uh, capabilities. That that's awesome. So, uh, I so I, I did have another question about the uh, your, your uh, the rapid prototyping events. I guess I was curious. Um, so how how you know when you have those events how how is a winner determined what's that process how's that um you know how 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 do you go about like selecting the winner and uh you know if the uh you know if there is interest in trying to get access to that capability what's you know the follow up steps to uh to make that happen how does how does that work so uh so different questions there the first question I'll answer is about the scoring 
So the, the uh, competitions, right, the challenges uh, are all created by the Maryland Innovation and Security Institute in concert with folks from U.S. Cyber Command. So they are always doing this in the context of one of U.S. Cyber Command's challenges. And uh, as part of the development of the challenge, they actually create a scoring mechanism and they say, you know, these are the things that we are looking for. Now, we don't necessarily, we don't share that, that scorecard, um, you know, necessarily directly with the competitors. Um, but, uh, but there is a meeting with the competitors after the event to share with them how their product performed. Um, in areas that in areas of interest that we had, um, and also if there happened to be if there was something that the product was doing which was unexpected, um, but is something that uh, U.S. Cybercom would be interested in. So just letting you know that um, that although this is all of the work which happens um, at Dreamport, you know, is under the guidance and control of Missy, there are always Cyber Command elements there, part of it as well. So you have, you know, actual cyber folks. I mean, you know, uh, for one of the rapid prototyping events, it was myself and, and our technical director, uh, and we were there saying, yeah, um, that's what we're looking for. No, that's not what we're looking for, right? Um, and so it's kind of throughout the event, uh, the comp they're getting points as they go along, uh, meeting the objectives. And then we simply add up those points, and whoever has the greatest number of points, that's the that's the that's the organization that's going to be the winner. And I say organization, you know, because it could be an academic institution that has a a tool or something that they've built, uh, or one of the labs or something uh, has something that they've built, um, you know, that's part of that competition as well. So it's not just commercial companies, um, you know, who are doing this. Okay. Well, that's that's great. Then, um, so there was a second follow-up question, which was, how does it then get to U.S. Cybercom to actually use it? Um, and that is uh, that is the reason why we have cyber teams who actually come to Dreamport and are part of the event. They are we refer to them as the sponsors, and it's. It's on that organization who is sponsoring this event to take all of this knowledge and information, bring it back inside U.S. Cybercom, and basically publish it, you know, internally. Um, I will say that, um, you know, Dreamport is, you know, a relatively new organization. We are just over six months uh, now. And uh, one of the things that we are looking uh, to harden is our mechanisms for sharing this information because um, because we believe that uh, the information really needs to be dispersed um, out to um, you know other cyber organizations. Uh, one of the things which I may be doing in future um, is attending a sort of a conference call which happens monthly. Um, with the National Guard. They, the National Guard recently came in uh, to talk about ways that we could share information. Uh, so I may be doing, you know, a, a monthly phone call where, you know, I share with them, you know, some of the things that we've learned through these events. So there's a lot of different ways that we want to get out that information. But at some point, we would like to publish, um, you know, the unclassified uh, results uh, that we are generating. But okay. right now that yeah, happens that sounds... through cyber. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds sounds great. Um, so well, there was one other inquiry. I don't know if you want to, uh, to if you have uh, any opinion on this, any suggestions. It's actually uh, well, one of our attendees is actually uh, in, in the process of working on his Ph.D. in uh, offensive cyber ops. And he's got to uh, make a decision on a, a dissertation topic in the near future. And he's actually wondering about researching exploitation of uh, 5G networks or 5G SIGINT. And um, was wondering what you thought about, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, kind of focusing on one of those areas. Uh, I absolutely think he should. Um, 
send an email. Well, there's emails here uh, for Carl for Carl Gumpel, um, and you also can. Uh, I mean, I'm interested <laughs> um, if that person's willing to share their their email address. Um, you can reach me at dreamportpm at cybercom.mil, and I'd be very happy. I am also a, a college professor, and you know I have a number of um, PhD candidates that I chair their committees or on their committees, and uh, that sounds like a, a fantastic um, topic. Okay. Uh, I also think yeah. there are some folks inside U.S. Cyber Command who'd be interested in, in maybe even participating uh, on that student committee if be interested. Oh, okay, very good, very good. That's that's awesome. Uh, well, I think we're I think we've uh, hit I think we've hit uh, most of the questions, and uh, this is um, you know a real you know real interesting presentation. The uh, you know, I think Dreamport is a uh, quite an interesting facility and capability. You know, to try to uh, you know uh, learn about capabilities and then bring them into uh, in into Cybercom for your for the Cyber Warriors to make use of them. And um, you know, Gail, I want to thank you for taking the time to share the info with us. And uh, you know, pre appreciate uh, appreciate the info. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity. It was an honor to um, have the opportunity to talk to your audience, uh, and I look forward to you know answering any other questions that folks have um, after the webinar. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And if folks, uh, so there's a bunch of contact info up on the the slide there. The uh, the slides will be posted on our website. The the uh, recording will be up there uh, in the, within a day or two, and um, and folks can always contact us here at uh, CSIAC as well at in info at csiac.org. Uh, but like I said, you can you know reach out directly to to Gail or the folks uh, listed there at Dreamport. There's a lot of different ways to make the connection. So you know if you've got if you've got questions, uh, you want to follow up. Um, definitely uh, definitely reach out to folks, and uh, we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll try to try to get you some feedback. So, so once again, Gail, thank you, and for the folks that attended today, uh, thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at uh, our uh, our future presentations. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye bye now. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.